Well, good morning. Glad you're here today. It's a great day already this morning as we've seen a lot of life change taking place and and uh, we're grateful to be able to share with you today. We got some more baptisms after the 1130 service and so we're still, we got a bunch more so it's going to be fun. Uh, glad you're here and uh, we're in the middle of a message series called Power Up. We're trying to power up our lives and trying to look at some people in the Bible whose uh, life has changed when they've uh, decided to power up. Not everybody makes it. Not, in fact, we're going to look at a guy today that struggled in this area. Uh, his name is Uzziah. He's a king. He had made a pretty big splash in the world, uh, had really uh, taken over um, the kingdom at 16 years old. Think about that. Like Justin Bieber would be our president. That's kind of, yeah. That's... Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But here's this great leader at 16 years old trying to figure out life. Let's look at this, 2 Chronicles 26.5. Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah is, a, is the prophet, and so that's kind of how they're uh, basing their calendar on. And so uh, Zechariah, who had taught him to fear God. So Zechariah's job was to help the king fear God. Some people are like, what does that mean? Like the first service that like, came up after the service, like, oh, we're supposed to be afraid of God. No. You don't have to be afraid of God uh, if uh, you're in a good relationship with Him, because God's not abusive. He's not. Uh, he's not going to be. He's not fickle. He, he's, he's like not one day or another. You're like, oh, I wonder what God we're going to get today. Uh, you can trust Him. Like a uh, like I fear my dad, but I'm not afraid of my dad. My dad's not going to abuse me or hurt me. I got a good dad. I got a great dad. Um, plus, now I can take him. So. Um, <laughs> But you, I, I think you maybe you kind of sense what I'm talking about here is that there's this healthy respect and fear that I'm going to take his words seriously. It is when we don't take our parents' words seriously that we get into trouble, isn't it? It is when we don't take our teacher's words seriously or our boss's words seriously or our pastor's words seriously, or right, that perhaps we begin to go our own way because we think we know better. So here is the Uzziah. As 16-year-old, he becomes king, and he had sought God as long... Check this out. As long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. I think that is a verse you should remember and memorize, put it on your refrigerator, because if you want success in life, it comes from two things. Fearing God and seeking guidance from the Lord. It is, again, when we don't fear God, we don't seek guidance from Him, we're not paying attention, we're not listening, we, don't, we can blow stuff off. It's no big deal. If I don't go listen to the pastor or, the, or read the Word of God, no big deal. Uh, I got life figured out. It is when we begin to think, I've got life figured out, and I've got my marriage figured out, I've got my kids figured out, I've got my wife figured out, i got uh, my boss figured out, i got business figured out, i got my money stuff figured out, is when we get into trouble. And uh, uh, you know that. So this, is, I think, is great. As long as, the, as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. Everything's great in the kingdom. It is strong, it is secure, it is healthy, and it is spiritually focused. It's what everybody wanted. The economy is vibrant, the military is powerful, and the nation is excelling, and the king is getting a reputation and because of his skills and for his knowledge in weaponry. It hadn't been all that, uh, been that all lot along when right before this 16-year-old king inherited the kingdom from his dad because his dad had run it into the ground. Military was weak. That's why that king died. Uh, the economy was bad. And he inherits all this stuff, and somehow the 16-year-old kid is able to hold it together because he's wise enough to listen to the prophet of God and to seek the Lord's wisdom. But years later, things happen. Check this out, Second Chronicles 26, not that long. But when he had become powerful, he also became proud. It does seem to go hand in hand, doesn't it? It doesn't take very long for us to take a look at some of the political world and see, wow, you know, people that we thought was going to lead and all of a sudden power got in there and all of a sudden it got a little messy. 
because pride had entered, thought we were pretty cool, thought we were pretty great, thought we had all the answers. But when he had become powerful, he had also become proud, which led to his downfall. He sinned against the Lord his God by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar, which seems insignificant. It's not like he's committing adultery here. He's not murdering anybody. He's really not being a bad person. He just kind of thought, I'll do this for, you know, I'll give the priest a little bit of day. I'll give him a day off. I think I can do it. I'm the king. I'm in pretty good shape. I'm, I'm doing it. And I don't know what got in his head, but he stepped into a place where he wasn't supposed to be. Azariah, the high priest, went in after him with 80 other priests of the Lord, all brave men. <laughs> Which, well, yeah, there was 80 of them. <laughs> One king, 80 guys. You know. And maybe, maybe they were nervous about this, I don't know. But, but when you confront the king, it doesn't always go well. So you need 80. It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn the incense to the Lord. That is the work of the priests alone, the descendants of Aaron, who were set apart for this work. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have sinned. Those are strong words. The Lord God will not honor you for this. Pride had taken hold of his life, and unwilling to listen to the priest, he was caught in a selfish act, and instead of dealing with it uh, appropriately, he digs in even more. And it costs him everything. That is how pride can be. Oftentimes when we know what we should be doing, we're not doing it, and we get confronted, and we, get, we dig in, we get defensive, and we get, uh, you know, who are you to tell me what to do? Pride comes in. Pride seems like strength. It seems like it would be something that you would want as a leader. Some time ago, a guy was doing research on um, perception, And he developed some lenses that flipped everything upside down. So the sky was on the bottom and, you know, the grass was up here and and the trees were hanging weird and stuff. And he he wore this around. And at first it really bothered him, gave him headaches, and he was like, couldn't get used to it. But eventually, as long as the longer he wore that, he got used to the way the world looked. So when he poured his orange juice, it looked like, you know, it was all, but he was able to figure it out. God steps into into our lives, and he's going to do his very best to flip it up upside down for us, because the way we do life most of the time is not the right way. Don Shula, the Hall of Fame coach for the Miami Dolphins, the last NFL team to go undefeated and to win the Super Bowl, um, uh, was vacationing with his wife in northern Maine. And... uh, you know, he thought he was pretty safe, but when, the, when him and his wife walked into a theater, people applauded. And he was kind of feeling pretty good about himself, and he leans over to his wife and says, can you believe it? In this podunk town in Maine, they know who I am. A guy walks over to them and shakes his hand and says, I'm a little, and Sheila says, I'm a little surprised you guys know who we are. He says, are we supposed to know who you are? Uh, the manager said we, we would start the movie as soon as we got 10. You guys made 10. Glad you're here. (laughs) Pride can be extremely dangerous, can it? And it causes all kinds of sickness in our life. And Jesus spent an enormous amount of time on the planet to try to help us become a community where pride was not a part of the equation and that we would just flip our world upside down. He says, he says something like this. Uh, If you want to become great, you, you really have to climb down the ladder, not up. So in Luke 18, he gives us a little clue here. He says, Jesus told a story to some, of the, some who had great confidence in their righteousness and scorned everyone else. So the, the motivation behind this is that he's got an audience of people who are extremely prideful about their religious walk. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a despised tax collector. I suppose they started chuckling at that moment. Oh, I've heard that one. Uh, a, a tax collector and a Pharisee walk into the, in the church. And, oh, yeah. You know. Because they already knew who the champion was going to be. It wasn't going to be the tax collector. But Jesus keeps going. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else, for I don't cheat and I don't smoke and I don't go out with girls. No, he, um, 
I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. And probably the audience listening go, yeah, I've heard that prayer. Yep, that sounds right. He's not making this stuff up. He's quoting, he's quoting him. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The Pharisee is, the Pharisee is a spiritual giant. He's a pro. He's in the major leagues. I mean, nobody can compete with him. He's way up there, and he likes himself a lot, and he believes all this stuff about himself, and um, he loves himself pretty well. He just doesn't like you <laughs> very well. Um, so here's this spiritual giant being contrasted with this spiritual infant. They're in two different leagues. One's in the major leagues, one's struggling in A ball. I mean, he just can't get out of it. He's uh, in that way, and so The Pharisee prays this prayer, God, thank you so much that I'm in a league of my own. I'm so glad to let you know today that I'm not an adulterer, that I'm not a murderer, that that I I don't do a whole, you know, I don't do evil. I'm pretty good. I avoid stuff and I and I do things. I fast twice a week and and uh, I give 10% and I'm I pray a lot and just want you to know. Now fasting uh, is where you go without food and stuff for a while and and um, uh, the Jewish law was that you would to fast once a year is this sacred moment where you would focus in not on food but on God. And, and, uh, but the Pharisees uh, decided to do it twice a week. Twice a week. Now, somewhere along the line, somebody said, hey, you know, we're supposed to fast once a year, but maybe we should do it twice a year. I think that would help us spiritually. I think we could grow more. I think, wouldn't it be great? And so some people started fasting twice a year, and then somebody says, well, maybe we should do it once a month. I think if we, you know, that's nice, but what if we did it 12 times a year? And people are like, okay, cool, let's do it. And so some of the people were like, yeah, let's go. And they began to do it. And then somebody said, twice, 12 times a year, I bet, what if we did it like every week? And uh, like, yeah, we should do it. So 50 times, to, like, and then somebody says, what if we did it twice a week? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's, and, but, for, you know, somebody's like, um, boy, if we carry this out uh, to what we think it's going to be, we're all going to die. We can't fast every day. And so they settled somewhere along the line of, of these days, and, and so that's what they did. And they would go, it wasn't, a, it wasn't so much that they fasted that way, but they would go to the marketplace, and so when people said, would you like something, would you, oh no, I'm fasting. Oh no, I'm fasting. Oh no, I'm fasting. Look at it, I'm fasting, and I'm singing. <laughs> they didn't say that, but it... It seemed to fit at that moment. So here's this tax collector coming into church, into the temple. He's not in the same league. He's a traitor, a low life, a dog, shunned by all the respectable people because he is a tax collector working for the government that was not the nation of Israel, but the Roman government that was an oppressive government to the spiritual lives of the Jewish nation. These heathen people running the government were getting money off the backs of these Jews, and here is this tax collector who would make his living and extort money from them. And so here's this guy. He, he goes to church. We're not even sure why he goes to church that day. Certainly he wasn't invited to church. I mean, nobody was going to invite the, hey, you want to go to church with us? Because you weren't going to be seen with the tax collector. Even if you felt like, man, I'm not in the league of the Pharisees, but I'm not inviting him. Wow, what do people think I'm a friend of his? And so, they, no, uh, so he wanders in by himself, and he's doing his best here to connect with God. And he can cast himself on the mercy of God, that low life, no good for nothing, piece of work tax collector who had no right and no business being in the temple of God. The one that he thinks is okay with God, he isn't. And his pride and arrogance are keeping him away. And he believes all the right stuff, and he does all the right stuff, and he gives all the right stuff. But Jesus says, that doesn't impress me much. And he turns their world upside down. 
He would do that again in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. He says, I warn you, unless, the, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And I'm sure when the people heard that thought, well, I'm going to hell then. I can't get in. There's no way. I can't be that good. I can't give that much. I can't pray that hard. I can't, I'm not fasting that way. I can't pull this off. I, I never got to be in the good schools. I, I don't know how to do stuff right. And, and Jesus is saying, well, the Pharisees are not very righteous at all. He's beginning to flip things upside down for us and redefine what it means to be right with God. And he's saying that the kingdom of heaven is going to be able to include this tax collector And it's available to everyone else. Those of us who have fatal flaws that we think will completely disqualify us from the kingdom of heaven, it is available to us. So he talks to those of us who are religious and who take their faith pretty seriously, and he's wanting to warn us. Many of us here today are believers in Christ, and so he's warning us, don't let pride keep you from God. Don't let your pride in your religion or your, right, get in the way of God. Let's take a look at some passages. Uh, Proverbs 29, 11. Whoever stubbornly refuses to accept criticism will suddenly be destroyed beyond recovery. Interesting. Whoever stubbornly refuses to accept criticism. Nobody likes criticism. I don't like criticism. I don't um, usually even appreciate it. I, you know, right? You don't, I, who do you think you are and what are you doing about that? Um, but, but oftentimes when criticism comes our way, we get incredibly and extremely defensive and not open to it because it just might be from God and we may not want to hear that. Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Controlling person really struggles with this area of submission to others. Matthew 7, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Again, oftentimes pride is the motivation behind the judgment. One of my favorite phrases of people who do this is, well, it may not be any of my business, but... (laughs) You ever hear that? Probably not any of my business, but pride is so deeply woven into our culture. I remember probably my first instance of this was when Muhammad Ali was on the scene declaring that he was the greatest of all time. We begin to live and breathe that kind of mentality. Joe Namath wrote, I can't wait until tomorrow because I keep getting better looking every day. I'm not sure Joe would say that now. If you've seen him lately, Don King, the promoter, said, I never cease to amaze my own self, and I say that in all humility. (laughs) But we watched a young man do that last Sunday, didn't we, after a football game, where he declared to the world, that he was the greatest. I sat there and watched that. What is going on? What is he doing? I still think he has to win a Super Bowl. Not sure how to handle that stuff. And I know, you know, who am I to, you know, right? But, but, I, but I began to think, whoa, pride comes, you know, especially when we're at the top of our game, like King Uzziah was. He was at the top of his game. The kingdom was doing so well, he just thought, this is no big deal. I am, by the way, the greatest, and I can pull this off. So how do we have that attitude of Jesus? Sometimes I think we work really super hard at being humble in the Christian community. Like, we want to to let everybody know that we're humble. So when somebody compliments us, we really say, oh, you look so pretty today. Oh, no. No, you look prettier. <laughs> you know, we just get super weird about stuff like, oh no, that's Jesus making me that beautiful. Jesus made me beautiful. It's not me. All right. I just be super, I'm just cautioning you that, is that we're called to be humble, 
But humble people are not to be cutting themselves down all the time. They're doing their very, humble people are going to do their very best to love their neighbor as their self and to love God with all their heart, soul, and mind and strength. So when, when you begin to know this is happening in your life, when you are happy for people, when you're happy for people, right? So when somebody gets recognized, you're happy for them, not going, that should have been me, and I'm much prettier, and I think I... Right? They're doing their best to be happy when their neighbor succeeds, uh, or when their co-worker succeeds, or when their spouse succeeds, or when another church in town succeeds. Every moment of every week is an opportunity to live in the kingdom of heaven. In, in Matthew chapter 6, uh, in the New Testament, in fact, I would encourage you, perhaps that would be a good exercise this week, is to read Matthew 6 and just kind of see how Jesus navigates through this time. Now, if you do the, read Matthew 6, uh, you don't have to tell me that you did it. Well, by the way, I memorized it. Oh, oh I think... Uh. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. In fact, I said, go ahead, go ahead. You just don't have to tell anybody. So when Jesus talks about fasting and praying and tithing and all that stuff, he says, whoa, 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 whoa. You, you go ahead, keep doing all that stuff. Just don't tell anybody about it. And I see this happening all the time now. Uh, you know what we call it? Facebook. <laughs> Twitter. Right? Hey, look at me. I'm at the Open Door Mission, helping poor people. Look at I'm with a poor person. What is that about, right? Now, again, I don't think it's a bad idea to take pictures of that and say, hey, you know, our church went there, that's great. And, and we're not bragging. We're just telling people, hey, this is what we did today. That's cool. I think that's awesome. But when it becomes to be a source of pride, hey, by the way, I go to Open Door every month. What's wrong with you? Um, I think we go a little bit, oh, by the way, I did this, you know, it's like, oh, careful, careful, careful. I think we got to be extremely careful. Hey, I'm fasting. I'm doing the Daniel plan. Uh, what are you, why aren't you doing that? Uh, by the way, uh, fasting was not given to be a weight loss program. <laughs> it wasn't. I think it's okay if you do that. Rick Warren's now talk, you know, talking about that. You know, I follow the Daniel plan and he's lost a bunch of weight because of that. Awesome, dude. Uh, and, you know, and, and you're to buy the book and read the stuff. and that's Sweet, that's cool. I think that's great. But it doesn't make it so that I'm more spiritual than you if you don't do it, right? And so we got to be super careful. And it's not a weight loss program. It's a place where we can kind of get beyond some stuff and where we fast or we give up some stuff so that we can focus in our relationship with God, not so that we can right, uh, lose 10. And it's not the purpose of that. And so uh, you, you may, fa I've done fasts before and gone on prayer and fasting retreats and those kind of things, and, I, and those have been helpful at times in my life, and then they've also been where I felt like, uh, I don't think I'm in the right frame of mind pulling this stuff off, and, and so you've got to kind of check your pulse on this stuff. And I think it's okay to give up some stuff, and maybe uh, for some of you, it would be harder to give up uh, social media than to give up food. <laughs> Ooh, I'll fast for food, but I'm not giving that up, right? And so maybe you say, well, you know what, maybe that's something that's kind of keeping me and I'm, I'm distracted and, and, uh, and maybe you need to do that. But uh, Jesus isn't saying stop doing those st stuff. He's not saying, hey, don't, you, don't, uh, you, you should stop giving or you should stop, you know, all that stuff. No, he says, just don't have to tell anybody about it. And it, is, it will be tempting this week for some of you to do, you know, to do something where you let somebody know that you're spiritually better or superior. And it, and, 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 and it just, you know, it, it can come off that way. And so you have to be careful about it. And you're going to be tempted, in fact, to put a little more of a spin on it than really is actually true. Um, you, might be, you might be tempted this week to judge someone um, and so you got to be very careful because judgment, is, pride is there before judgment comes in. So it's very easy to do that. And perhaps it's just your chance, it's just your chance to be quiet and to live in the kingdom of God. For some of you, it might come in a form of service, you know, that, that uh, you're, you, you know, you think, well, I need to be involved in, in ministry stuff and you're thinking through stuff and they go, well, 
and we don't typically think like this, but you know, or say it out loud. But we're thinking, well, I want, I kind of want the, um, the spotlight job. I don't want to be on the cleaning crew. Um, you know, I mean, if, again, I think that one of the best things we can do if we are struggling with pride is to find a place of service that's out of the line, out of the spotlight, out of the state, off the stage where I just do stuff where nobody really, you know, it's not, nobody really notices me, or there's not a whole lot of pats on the back, or, right? Hey, you're, you know, you're so awesome. And some of you have been gifted in certain areas. Um, maybe you have been gifted in cleaning, and you like to clean. You've been honing your skills of like, you know, you really like it. Uh, and so, by all means, you should use that skill. Now, when you get here and you help clean, I don't think you should say, you do it the way I'm doing it. You know, we got to be careful with that. But every time we serve the kingdom of God, I'm not serving my own kingdom. If you need to deal with pride, find some place to serve. Probably some way, place way out of the limelight, way out of the spotlight, and take a back seat and a back room, and no act, but and, and, and so that nobody really notices. No act of service is going to go, uh, uh, that, will be, uh, that will be lost. So when it, every time I serve, it makes a difference, makes an impact. And pride gets pushed back a little bit farther. And I suppose um, this sin is as um, big a struggle for me as there is. And I'm not sure where that crept in in my life. It's been there for a long time. I remember in a job interview, I was interviewing to be a youth pastor. And uh, I, had, I had zero experience because um, I was an intern. And I had dinked around in some areas, you know. But I was interviewing for one of my first jobs. And, and um, I had just gone to a youth conference uh, where they trained youth leaders. And so I'm thinking, Hey, uh, those guys are idiots. If, the, if they're the top of the game, I can pull that off. And so when the person interviewing me said, on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you rank yourself? 1 being, you know, not so great. 10 being, right? Without blinking, I said 10. I, I didn't even blink. 10. Because I thought, those guys are bozos. I am way better than that. And um, what an idiot. Who did I think I was? And I know at times that's creeped into my life more than I'd like to admit. And uh, so, uh, believe me, I understand pride and what it can do to um, your heart and your life and your marriage and your kingdom. And so, would you continue to pray for this pastor who uh, struggles in this area? I would appreciate that. And uh, I'm thankful for that. But it is uh, an issue in which as we get more and more like Zechariah, we become more and more powerful. Maybe it's at work, or maybe it's in our marriage, maybe it's in our church. Maybe it's in the political arena. That pride can lead to a downfall. I don't need any help. I got my marriage. Everything's fine. I can, we know what we're doing. I don't need help. I know what I'm doing. I don't need any help. I know what I'm doing. And so uh, it's pretty easy for us to get lost and sideways, even spiritually. All right? Father God, we do ask that at this moment in time that you would continue to work in our lives and our hearts so that we would not become so prideful, even in our spiritual walk with you, that we would coast or neglect your instruction. That we would be constantly open to your word and from godly people who would speak into our lives. Help us to not dig in. Um, 
and help us not to be so close, uh, quick to reach for judgment in other people's lives. All right, continue to work in our hearts. In Christ's name, amen.